On the afternoon of June 8, 1940, the British aircraft carrier HMS Glorious was travelling west across the Norwegian Sea, having evacuated RAF planes from Narvik. She was escorted only by two destroyers and was steaming with one third of her boilers shut down. Suddenly, smoke was spotted on the horizon, followed by the unmistakable silhouette of two German battleships. Within hours, all three British ships would be sunk, costing the lives of over 1,500 sailors in one of the worst British naval disasters of the Second World War. HMS Glorious had been dispatched to Norway on May 31st, along with another aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal. An evacuation of Allied troops at Narvik had been ordered and the two carriers were to aid in its completion. For Glorious, this meant embarking Gladiator and Hurricane RAF fighters which had been operating from Bardafoss Air Base. This operation, involving a risky carrier deck landing for planes that were not designed for it, was completed by the end of June 7th. Glorious set sail for home in the early hours of the following morning, with the destroyers Ardent and De Castor attached to provide protection against submarine attacks. With a threat from German surface ships not considered a possibility, Glorious proceeded slowly home at just 17 knots. However, unknown to the crew of Glorious and to the rest of the home fleet, a powerful German squadron had left Kiel on June 4th and was now lurking in the Norwegian Sea some 200 miles southeast of Jan Mayen. The two German battleships, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, were joined by the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper and escorted by four destroyers. In command was Admiral Wilhelm Marshall. While Hipper and the destroyers were detached to hunt smaller British ships returning from Norway, Marshall kept his two battleships well to the north, looking for any signs of large Allied convoys steaming from Narvik which he could intercept. Instead, at 3.45pm on June 8th, the lookout on board Scharnhorst spotted the enormous silhouette of an almost completely undefended aircraft carrier. Both ships quickly altered course to close on HMS Glorious, which was only now realising it was under threat. Incredibly, Glorious had no lookout posted to its crow's nest and no aerial reconnaissance planes in the air. She desperately tried to run but was no match for the German battleship's speed. By 4.30, Scharnhorst was in range and opened fire with her nine 11-inch guns. Gneisenau followed soon afterwards. With her third salvo, Scharnhorst scored the first of many hits on Glorious's Ford hangar, starting a fire which quickly began to burn out of control. Glorious's captain, Guy Dolly Hughes, sent out a distress signal but it was jammed by Gneisenau. Unable to launch aircraft into the wind without turning towards the German ships, Glorious was a sitting duck. Seeking to buy time for the carrier, the two destroyers moved into position to lay a smokescreen, obscuring Glorious from the German guns as best they could. HMS Ardent, commanded by Lieutenant Commander John Barker, then burst through her own smoke to launch torpedoes, one of which passed just yards in front of Scharnhorst's bow. Forcing the German ship to take evasive manoeuvres, Ardent exposed herself to the withering fire of the two battleships' powerful secondary armaments. Within four minutes, Ardent had been obliterated sinking with all but two hands at 528. As she did so, Glorious re-emerged from the smokescreen and soon came under a hail of fire. By 540, she was a burning wreck, being hit almost constantly and steadily sinking into the Norwegian Sea. This just left a caster, which was steaming directly away from the German battleships and laying smoke. On board, Commander Charles Glasford addressed his crew. You may think we are running away from the enemy, we are not. Our chummy ship has sunk, the Glorious is sinking, the least we can do is make a show. Good luck to you all. With that, Acasta turned about 180 degrees, steamed back through her own smoke and charged the 33,000 ton battleships. Turning hard to port, she launched torpedoes from her starboard side and fired her little 4 inch guns on her heavily armoured opponents. One of Acasta's torpedoes struck the Scharnhorst near her rear turret disabling it and blowing a hole in the side of the ship that shut down two of her three engine rooms. It was a momentary piece of good luck with the British, but it was to be a caster's last success. As both battleships focused their fire on her, she was quickly set ablaze and reduced to less than five knots. Still, her crew continued to man her guns, scoring another superficial hit on Scharnhorst before finally succumbing to her grievous damage. HMS Glorious sank at 6.08, followed 
by a caster at 6.16pm. Leading seaman Cyril Carter, who was the sole survivor from HMS Acasta, would later recall, While I was in the water, I saw the captain leaning over the bridge, take a cigarette from a case and light it. We shouted to him to come on our raft. He waved, goodbye and good luck. The end of a gallant man. Carter would join 44 sailors from HMS Glorious in being rescued from the sea by a Norwegian merchant ship two days later, with the rest of the crews, some 1,531 sailors, perishing. It was a colossal disaster that could have gotten even worse had Acasta not sacrificed herself to damage Scharnhorst. Forced to escort his damaged battleship back to Trondheim for repairs, Admiral Marshall was not able to engage a British convoy carrying 14,000 troops back from Norway, which was not that far away from where Glorious had been intercepted. The actions of Commander Glasford and his crew had potentially saved thousands of other Allied lives. Nonetheless, this was a tragedy for the Royal Navy. And in the decades since the end of the Second World War, the reasons for the sinking have been heavily scrutinised, including in the British Parliament. In January 1999, almost 60 years after the sinking of Glorious, MP Alan Beath raised a debate on the subject, during which he posed three questions which get right to the heart of the contentious issues. Firstly, why was Glorious returning home independently of the main convoy? Secondly, was there not sufficient intelligence about German activity in the region to suggest that Gloria should have been in a much greater state of readiness? And thirdly, could HMS Devonshire have helped the stricken vessel, or did its commander have no idea of what was happening? First, let's address the reasons for Glorious not being with the troop convoy that left later, and that could have provided better protection for the aircraft carrier. The Admiralty's explanation for this hinges on the notion that Glorious was low on fuel, and had to return to the UK earlier than the convoy. This theory was described immediately after the war by Winston Churchill as not convincing. The Glorious presumably had enough fuel to steam at the speed of the convoy. All should have kept together. Even more extraordinarily, Captain Roskill, the man who had written the RN's official war history, wrote in 1977 that the shortage of fuel theory is false. The central problem with this theory, as Churchill implied, is that had Gloria steamed with the convoy instead of independently, she would have been travelling at a slower speed and thus consumed less fuel overall on her voyage home. If she had the fuel to sail on her own, goes the counter-argument, then she had the fuel to travel with the convoy. An alternative explanation for the early departure of Glorious has been supported by Roskill, as well as naval historians Corelli Barnett and John Winton. Mentioned by Beath in 1999, this theory argued that her detachment was due to a serious breakdown in relations among her senior officers. In the weeks before Glorious's last deployment, tensions had run high between her captain, Guy Doyle Hughes, and the commander of his aircraft, John Heath. Things had gotten so bad that Hughes had put Heath ashore at Scarpa Flow to await court-martial for cowardice, following Heath's subjection to orders he viewed as impossible. Captain Hughes, though a man of exceptional personal bravery, was, according to Corelli Barnett, a throwback to the worst kind of arrogant, authoritarian, and choleric Edwardian naval officer. It's suggested by Barnett that perhaps he had become so obsessed with court-martialing his commander that he had taken Glorious back early to carry it out. This theory is supported by Lieutenant Commander Edward Legleet, who commanded the destroyer HMS Diana at Narvik. According to Stephen Roskill, Legleet saw Glorious signal to Vice Admiral Lionel Wells on board Ark Royal, asking for permission to return to Scarpa Flow to make preparations for the court martial. In response to this argument, the Ministry of Defence still stuck to the shortage of fuel theory, arguing that at the time of her departure the convoy had not formed, and if she had remained off the coast of Norway waiting for the convoy to form, fuel would certainly have been consumed and could have become an issue. As the home fleet was not aware of any surface threat to its ships, it's not inconceivable that fuel could have played a part in the way the MOD believes, but it leads us to ask the question, why was the home fleet unaware of the presence of Admiral Marshall's squadron? The answer to this question is most likely that the Admiralty failed to pass on intelligence warnings to those in the position to react to events. Sir Harry Hinsley, who was working at British Intelligence at Bletchley Park in 1940, wrote after the war that analysis of German radio traffic in the 10 days prior to the sinking suggested that German main units were likely to proceed to Norwegian waters. Despite this, no warning was ever passed on the Admiralty to the Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet let alone anyone at a more junior level. Consequently, Glorious was totally unprepared for confrontation with two German battleships. 
It is worth remembering that Hindley himself described traffic analysis in 1940 as an untested technique, but he argues there was still no good reason for the intelligence to be completely disregarded in the way that it was. At the very least, a warning to the fleet to maintain a higher state of readiness may have been enough to save Glorious had she maintained aerial reconnaissance to warn of approaching attackers. Glorious herself, as we know, did try to warn British ships of her attack, but only one Royal Navy ship heard anything from her, the cruiser HMS Devonshire, which was carrying Norway's government back to the UK. According to the Admiralty, Devonshire only heard one garbled transmission that made little sense. Well, did she? Alan Beath raised doubts about this, pointing to the fact that Devonshire exercised her main armament at 4.25 on June 8th, minutes after Glorious sent her first signal, one that Devonshire did not record receipt of. About an hour later, Devonshire increased speed to 30 knots for the only time in her voyage back to the UK, not long after Glorious's last signal, which was recorded by Devonshire as a garbled mess. Beath argues that these two events cannot have been coincidences, and that in fact Devonshire had been able to work out more information than previously thought. Remarkably, however, it seems possible that both these actions were in fact coincidental, as the Admiralty argued. Firstly, it's unlikely that if Devonshire had received Glorious's first signal, she would not have recorded it in the way she did her later message. In addition, that second message was recorded as reading my 415 2P-B, which gives no information about the carrier's position and gives no indication that she was under attack. It simply refers to her earlier signal that Devonshire did not hear and mentions two pocket battleships. It seems unlikely, therefore, that Devonshire possessed enough information to go to Glorious's aid, especially when doing so would mean carrying the entire Norwegian royal family and government into potential danger. Ultimately, we will never know the precise truth of why Glorious was steaming on her own that day, or why she had no area reconnaissance operating, for the simple reason that nobody who could have provided insight into these decisions survived the sinking. However, I do think we can view the sinking of Glorious as a completely avoidable tragedy. If the Navy had been less arrogant in assuming their command of the sea was untouchable, if warnings had been passed on, perhaps the capital ships of the home fleet might have been on hand to prevent the calamity that befell Glorious, Ardent and Acasta that day. What do you think? Post in the comments below to join the discussion, or you can follow us on Twitter and tweet us there at Historograph. If you enjoyed this video, consider becoming a patron of the channel so I can make more like it. Historograph doesn't currently have monetization from YouTube, so the support of our patrons means everything. Thanks for watching this video on the sinking of HMS Glorious, and we'll see you next time.